and I am the creative director of Theologizing the Caribbean's Decolonization at Union Theological Seminary in New York City. On behalf of Union Theological Seminary, uh, El Corredor Afro, and Copi of uh, Piñones, uh, Puerto Rico, we would like to welcome you to the Decolonizing Interfaith Dialogue. Um, and before we get started, I would like to invite Dr. Baba Lao, Dr. Carol Miranda, um, to give us some opening words of prayer and meditation. Oriba balofing, Oriba balorum, Oriba balor do mare, Moyuba lofi, Moyuba lorum, Moyuba lor do mare, Moyuba chupa, Moyuba gere, Moyubi rawo, Moyubi rumole yu, tu, Moyuba rumole yu, si, Moyuba lorum coco imbre, Moyuba mofori bale a camara. O mi tuto, na tuto, tutu ile, tutu la roye, tuto nini, tuto esho, tutu ile, tutu e gungun, tutu irumole, tutu orisha, awo, tu mo sine ashel awo. Iba avanto nu bobo gungun alawo to kuara nu ke timberese olo dumare. Iba avanto nu bobo gungun of all the speakers here present ke timberese olo dumare. Iba avanto nu bobo gungun de of all the attendants uh, present today ke timberese olo dumare. Vimo duro, vimo ure, ire mi casa ibao. Vimo kun le, vimo dure, ire mi casa y bao. Vimo bere, vimo ure, ire mi casa y bao. Vimo kun le, vimo ure, ire mi casa y bao. Olo du mari le mo yubae, adie un bomi, mo yubao, oru. Mole y le moyu bae, adie un bomi, moyu bao, oru, boborisha y le moyu bae, adie un bomi, moyu bao, oru, bobogun y le moyu bae, adie un bomi, moyu bao, oru. By the grace of Olodumare, invoking all the ancestors, and all those who came before us, and all those who are with us to bless this meeting, so the words of wisdom can flow, so the words of love can flow, and the good conversation can, can take place in the name of everything that is holy, in the name of everything that protects us. Ashe. Ashe. Thank you so much, Baba Lao. Um, and as I said, my name is Naya Toussaint. For those of you who may have just joined us, um, we were um, just blessed with a prayer and a meditation to center us as we walk into this conversation. Uh, we are joined by practitioners and um, scholars from all over uh, the world. And we are just excited to be here in this conversation. I am also joined um, by Bridget Webster, who if she can just give us a little wave, who will be, um, we will be your co-host uh, throughout the evening today. And so um, I would like to take some time now to uh, introduce our moderators. And so first I would like to introduce Dr. Marta Moreno Vega. Um, and, oh, I'm sorry. One second. Dr. Vega um, has been a partner of ours um, and we are just so, so excited to continue the work that we have been doing um, with her. Um, we actually um, began this partnership with a, between Union um, and Dr. Vega last summer with a immersion trip um, between Dr. Cruz and Dr. Vega to Loisa, Puerto Rico. Um, and it has just been a absolute pleasure to work with her. Um, I have truly learned so, so much from her. And here is a little bit about her officially. Dr. Marta Moreno Vega has grounded her life's work in the powerful experiences of people of African descent, developing cultural institutions that affirm their impact on the world stage. She established the Caribbean Cultural Center African Diaspora Institute in New York City and was the second director of El Museo del Barrio. 
She is presently working on the co-creation of El Corredor Afro in Loisa, Puerto Rico. So I would like to just welcome Dr. Moreno Vega, just to say some uh, well, words of, of welcome. Well, thank you very much, Naya, for the introduction. And thank you all for being with us. Actually, this is the second session. We started the first uh, conversation in Copi, in Piñones, directed by Mari Cruz Rivera, a Clemente, who um, welcomed us into her space. And the first gathering made it very clear that the sacred has many faces, has many voices, and we have to learn to honor all of those sacredness and voices. So welcome. Thank you, Dr. Moreno Vega. And now I would like to introduce um, our other moderator, who is Dr. Samuel Cruz, who is an associate professor of religion and society at Union Theological Seminary and pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. Over the last 15 years, Dr. Cruz has been conducting ethnographic research on urban and Caribbean Latinx religion, focusing predominantly on Pentecostalism and African-based Caribbean slash Latinx religions as well as comparative analysis of Latinx religion and Euro-American religious traditions. So I would like to welcome Dr. Cruz to make some of the opening remarks um, and to pass it over to him. But before I do that, I wanna invite all of our guests who are on Facebook and YouTube to feel free to chat it up in the um, chat boxes and um, also to know that we will get your questions to our moderators um, in order for any questions you have for our many panelists um, to be asked and to be answered, hopefully, as best as we can. Um, so at this time, I would like to hand the program over to Dr. Cruz and Dr. Moreno Vega. Um, welcome to the second panel of Decolonizing Interreligious Dialogue. The first one, as Manta mentioned, was held in Piñones last May at COPI, and I want to thank Dr. Manta Moreno Vega and Maricruz Clemente for making that first and now the second dialogue together with myself and Union Theological Seminary become a reality. Uh, let me just say something quickly that I wasn't going to say, but I was thinking we're talking about interreligious dialogue, which ultimately means people of different religious traditions working together and dialoguing together. Well, it can be done in very fruitful ways. And Malta and I don't call it this, but uh, we've been doing it. Me as a Lutheran pastor, Puerto Rican Lutheran pastor in Brooklyn, New York. And Malta have been doing some little things together and we've been trying to be supportive to each other. So that happens, that's happening already in powerful ways and it's powerful. And for me, um, those are the things that we should be doing as people who have a spiritual uh, walk. Why this panel? The, the, this panel was put together so that the wisdom and contributions of, Af of the African spiritual traditions in Africa and in the diaspora that have been ignored or relegated to a position of, of inferior, inferiority can be brought to the forefront so that th that wisdom uh, could be shared especially among ourselves who come from traditions that have been marginalized, even within Christianity, when you're Latinx, you're marginalized. So we're here to have a discussion about that. Uh, we, we are usually not invited to participate uh, in the dialogues that are taking place, interreligious dialogues. Uh, we're not included. So we're creating our spaces to do so. This distinguished, uh, I also wanted to mention that the, the flyer that we now says interfaith dialogue and many people, especially from the global south have mentioned to me that we should have called it interreligious dialogue rather than interfaith. Interfaith has this problematic historical colonial and oppressive background. Um, I wanted to say that I chose the word interfaith, maybe, I, and I should have gone with interreligious because more people are uh, aware of the term interfaith. And interreligious is being used more in academic circles, so everybody knows what that is. But uh, they, the people who brought it up to me were correct. 
And also I said that it's been around for 15 years, this dialogue. I was talking about, I was thinking more of academic circles, but interreligious dialogue has been taking place for hundreds of years or for a long time among uh, the people from the global South. We've been doing this forever. Uh, this panel will discuss the colonial degradation, denigration of their traditions, but how they have survived and the wisdom that these traditions have to offer and how these traditions, our traditions could uh, help those and everyone who wants to engage in true and open and fair interreligious dialogue. But I wanna say two things or, or offer two quotes before we move on into the discussion of some of the obstacles that I see that continue to perpetuate the colonization of religions at, at the margins of society. And one is a quote by a French social theorist, Pierre Bourdieu, in which he said, it's a little complicated, but I'll flesh it out. Because religion, like all symbolic systems, is predisposed to fulfill a function of association and disassociation, or better, of distinction, a system of practices and beliefs is made to appear as magic or sorcery and inferior religion whenever it occupies a dominated position in the structures of relations of symbolic power. That is, in the systems of relations between the systems of practices and beliefs the belonging to a determined social formation. In other words, to try to simplify it, religion is culture. And what Bourdieu is saying here that some cultural systems are deemed higher or lower in an arbitrary fashion. There's nothing, it has nothing to do with the culture itself. It has to do with what place in society that culture has. So if it comes from the people of the bottom, those religions will be looked at as sorcery, magic, or evil. And that's some of the myths that we want to, uh, it, it's basically based on power and domination, it has nothing to do with the religious tradition. The second thing is that the way interreligious engagement has been occurring, interreligious dialogue has been occurring, uh, it excludes, it continues to exclude, and in some ways it continues to be colonial. It left one colonial process of just imposing your religion, the powerful religion historically has been Christianity, uh, to creating a system of the imposition of several powerful religions that take the, the lead. And Rachel Chow, cultural critic Rachel Chow, in regards to the study of literature, said something that applies to what we're trying to do here tonight. She said, of all the prominent features of Eurocentrism, the one that stands out in the context of the university is the conception of culture as based on the modern European notion of the nation state. In this light, comparative literature has been rightly criticized for having concentrated on the literatures of a few strong nation states in modern Europe. But the problem does not go away if we simply substitute India, China, and Japan for England, France, and Germany. To this day, we will still witness publications that bear titles such as comparative approaches to masterpieces of Asian literature, which adopt precisely this Eurocentric nation-oriented model of literature in the name of the other. So what has been done quite often in academic circles is that when there's interreligious engagement, they say we could include we could include people outside of Europe to show that they've moved beyond the colonial process. But the question is, who do they choose? Which are the countries that they choose? And it's usually based on power, based on nations. So that's why there's all this interreligious engagement that continues to happen, but you rarely see people of the African traditions being included in the conversation. So tonight, we, uh, our intention to some extent is to highlight the traditions that the dominant culture has set to the side. 
and bring forth the wisdom that we can garner from these traditions. And I'm excited to have this impressive panel with us today. And our first speaker is Dr. Aliu Niang, who's Associate Professor of New Testament at Union Theological Seminary in New York. Uh, welcome, Aliu. Thank you, Dr. Cruz. Thank you, Dr. Cruz, and thank you, everyone. Uh, I will begin by just giving you one idea on, uh, on how we greet one another as people of Senegal, West Africa. Kasumai, Kasumai means peace slash well-being. So uh, I would like to start with that. I was born in Senegal, the oldest French colony in West Africa, a country known for one of the key uh, things that we uh, talk about in terms of scholarship, that is uh, a country that was colonized, but also one that uh, underwent some changes. Prior to the colonization, uh, it was quite an interesting West African relationship between the groups of people, but when colonization came, things changed rapidly. So the map will give you an idea as to what I'm talking about, the Atlantic Ocean. You have the Atlantic Ocean, um, let me see, my, let me, okay, good. The Atlantic Ocean here, and you have Mauritania, Mali on this side, and of course you have the continent of Africa, and Senegal is right here, that's the dot right there. So Jola people, and I'll be speaking about Jola religion, and please, I'm using the word religion, but we don't have that word. So basically, the word religion is actually a colonial creation as far as we can see. So as you can see, these dots are Jola settlements. And, um, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So my mother was Jola, who converted to Christianity later. But I will say something about uh, what I mean. The word conversion, again, doesn't work in my context. And my father was Muslim of, Sufi, of the Sufi order. So you can see I was well-rounded. I was in a context where it's quite uh, a unique context that uh, those of us in the global South experience. And that is the um, connectivity between religious expressions. So I consider myself as one who actually has various traditions in my uh, own thinking, day-to-day, -day, my practices, and so on. So my life in teaching, reading, scripture sh is shaped by this tradition that I'm talking about. And uh, my context is as diverse as what you're hearing me say. So prior to the arrival of Islam and Christianity in Senegal, there was, I would argue, a West African understanding of what it means to relate to other people. And we use the word hospitality and it goes across groups. And that hospitality is a crucial element in how we relate to one another. It is informed by a sense of mutuality. Senegalese people also use this idea of teranga and with this teranga, you have 94% Muslims, 5% Christians, and 1% indigenous uh, practitioners of indigenous religion. So what I just said, some of us will wonder, wait a minute, there, were, there are more Muslims than Christians. Yes, 
than traditionalists, yes. But here is what I would say before I continue. That it doesn't matter whether you're a Muslim or a Christian or a traditionalist, there are, so, there are things that connect us that predates the arrival of Christianity in Senegal and it predates also Islam in Senegal. Now, so the PowerPoint you're looking at, I'll move to something that I'm calling what we do. <laughs> and what we do is interesting because as I focus on the Jolo religion, then you begin to see that we don't have the word religion. So what we do, it's what I translate to mean religion so we can have this discussion. As a Jola, the word religion doesn't make sense. I don't know what it is. But if you say what we do, then I got it. The path, I understand that. The journey, I understand that, but not the word religion in terms of lexicography. Now, so um, the Jola is, uh, the, the way it, the word Jola, the group called Jola people, they defined by foreign ethnographers. So when the ethnographers encounter the word Jola, you see the different spelling. And so the PowerPoint will show you um, Jola or Jula. So, but again, when I hear someone pronouncing, am I hearing the word Jola? So what does that mean? It means visible beings. So in Jola, what we do, there's this idea that we are visible beings among other visible beings, but they're also invisible beings. So that's the reason why the word Jola captures that now. And I will say more about that in our discussion. We have about 10 subgroups of Jola people. The language is basically has same roots, but there are variations of that. And the Jola practice egalitarian ways of life. So, and as you can see the map, you see the location geographically where the Jola live. And when the colonial French officials came, they were targeting this particular area because it's what we call in Senegal, the bread basket of the country. So you can see why colonizers will target it, and they did. Unfortunately, the Jolo people <laughs> um, didn't believe in centralized government. And so since they didn't believe in central, centralized government, they mounted a resistance against the colonizer. And I would say any group of people being colonized will mount some resistance in many ways. So this takes me back then to the idea of Jola religion, what we do, what is it? What do we do? Um, these visible beings called Jola people have a supreme deity and the PowerPoint will show us that. The next slide, we see uh, if religion, it's in essence of Jola will know the word butin in Jola, which is path, journey, or what we do. The supreme deity then is called Allah Emit, or Emitai, or simply Emit. Now, so you will find Jola people using this word. Now, this supreme being, it's not solely transcendent, which anthropologists who came and observed the Jola tended to have described Jola what we do, which is a mistake. So for the Jola, 
the supreme being is very much involved in the day-to-day -day decision into relationships of the people. So this takes me then to what does Ojola believe? Well, Ojola believes that the first ancestor can be traced back to this supreme being who created the first ancestors. So the first ancestors then are crucial. According to oral myths, these first ancestors transmitted the proper rituals that we should be actually holding seasonally, but also there are other rituals that we need to continue, the, to, continue to build this sense of egalitarian ways of life because egalitarian way of life among the Jola, it's not, it's not uh, a, it's not something that doesn't require some work. So we are trained, we are trained by the elders to ensure this idea of egalitarian life is practiced because of how delicate it is. So, um, for, so the Jola then believes that Emitai is responsible for creating life and sustaining life. But we Jola people, we are now through the rituals responding to this supreme being and the supreme being is now communicating to specific people such as the elders, the priests in specific locations such as shrines where the elders will help us now understand what it means to act justly toward one another. So when the French came then, they tried to dismantle that kind of religious devotion. And one prophet who was the most well-known prophet among the Jola, her name is Alun Sitoye Jata. And she was arrested by the French because of her promoting this sense of egalitarian way of life, but not just egalitarian way of life, Muslims join her community. Christian, Christians join the community. Those who don't profess any faith at all were also welcome into the community. So then the question is, what kind of community we have here? We have a community that is welcoming visible human beings, just like the name Jola. So egalitarian society, the supreme deity is the one who regulates life within the community. The elders make sure that they communicate that through rituals, but also some teachings. And we have also prophets such as Alin Sutoi Jata to warn the people during the height of colonization, not to forget Jola's sense of egalitarian life and that the supreme being will be with us if we continue to value one another. Not just the Jola traditional practitioner, but also the Christian who would like to join the community, the Muslim who would like to join the community. So why? Because all are visible beings who can be traced ancestrally to the first ancestors who go back to the Supreme Being. So in conclusion, mutuality anchors what we do. And what is what we do? What we do for the lack of a good definition is what we call religion, heuristically. And this kind of mutualism inspires, inspires the kind of participatory hospitality that cultivates and re-images an egalitarian vision. Thank you.
One second, Dr. Cruz. We just need you to unmute. Thank you, Dr. Nian. Could you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, now I have the privilege of introducing Babalao, Dr. Joseph Carroll Miranda. Uh, he is a Babalao in the Lukumi tradition. He is also a graduate studies professor at the College of Education at the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras campus. And his re research interests include computer science education and some other stuff. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> thank you. Welcome, Babalao, Joseph. Thank you. Um, the, the presentation that I want to share with you, uh, it's titled Embodying Our Past Guarantees Our Future. It's really uh, paying homage to uh, all the ancestors that came before us uh, and those who lived through us and those who will continue to live on when we, when we move on. Um, and this is hand in glove, a perfect segue uh, to speak about very similar things as our previous presenter shared with us. The, the, the first one is the, the notion of, uh, oh, for some reason I can't change the slides. Um, uh, none, nonetheless, uh, the Lokumi tradition uh, benefits from, from a tradition of the African slave trade in the Caribbean. And the Lokumi is really a redefinition of a lot of different faiths that were forced to uh, coexist. And it has the, the, it's a fusion of traditions. It's not, uh, although majority is uh, from the Yoruba people, uh, we cannot deny the influence of the of Congo, of Mali, of Dahomey, of Arara, and uh, the, there was a lot of dialogue in the syncretism. Although the famous form of syncretism is that it adopted the Catholic iconography, uh, it really incorporated in the ceremonies, rituals, and prayers a lot of elements from different African nations that co coexisted and coincided. So there was a there was a fusion that happened that it is not talked is not talked as much as it should. How uh, the Lokumi tradition is a, is a blend of a lot of experiences that we're going to have the benefit from other uh, colleagues presenting from Palo and Buru that can uh, address the, that those specifics. Uh, the the fusion was there, the dialogue was there, and because of that fusion, there's this notion of uh, of an open door policy in within our tradition it's common to see a people from different faiths to look upon uh, different priests and priestesses for uh, divination, healing, and, and medicine. And so when I say that embodying the past guarantees our, our future is, is, is going back to the, the, the philosophical tenets that I think are really important to address a decolonial dialogue. And it's the notion of uh, those those first ancestors and the first ancestor uh, really came about the, uh, it, within the, our faith. The first the, the first ancestor was a woman, and her name was O oh, Mini Binini, and Mini Binini was the the one who uh, gave birth with uh, the a sacred uh, spirit called uh, Odudua, um, and they birthed a, a birth of uh, of uh, eight twins. And, and these children were referred to as Omolua B. Now Omolua B, what it means is children, the children of the, of the one who brings good character. And the children who bring good character is, is a basic tenet, really important when, when, within our faith because we all have the obligation to have this good character in qualities such as uh, humility, dedication, patience, hopefulness, understanding, benevolence, honesty, and truthfulness. And uh, in terms of philosophical tenet, we need to avoid and deter greed, selfishness, intolerance, pride, wickedness, envy, hatred, and anger. 
these elements of character are to be avoided. It's taboo. It's not looked good upon. And uh, the virtues of the good character generates uh, much needed balance. When we do not uh, act with good character, what we create is unbalance and chaos. Uh, relationships break, communities uh, break, uh, and entropy actually ensues. And so there's this saying within our tradition that ayamo ni wapele, y wapele ni ayamo, which says, good character is my destiny. Destiny is good character. Now embodying the past is important because creator, Olodumare says, we are here on earth to refresh our good character. We need to leave the earth better than how we found it. And if we don't do it, um, then it's quite clear that we bring destruction to ourselves, we bring destruction to our families, we bring destruction to our communities. And this originally happened in the third stage of creation. There was a time of a lot of wickedness, um, a lot of wickedness that created a lot of unbalance within, within the earth and it was destroyed. And humanity resettled again the earth. And we are in a historical conundrum where in order for humanity to go into the fifth stage of creation, we need to embody as, as community, the concept or the notion of alashuwada. And this is really important because this basically uh, enforces us to embody the common, a common collective consciousness for the same, the same way that a tree can become a forest and then the forest can become a jungle or the blade of grass makes the pasture and the pasture makes the savanna. Ourselves as, as human beings, humanity, we need to see ourselves as collective beings. And we need to embody the traditional ways of living in, in such a way that we honor the sacred, respect the delicate balance within Mother Earth in a way that we can guarantee uh, the balance necessary for future generations to continue to live in, in, in in the world. And so the challenge that, that I bring is within this dialogue is embodying the past is returning to these old values of, of, of a communal way of being, of, of being in balance and in and, 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 uh, everything uh, with a lack uh, equitable or egalitarian. It has to be in balance. So it's, it's, it's immoral for a lot to have, a few to have a lot and few to have many, so because that brings that brings the notion of breaking that balance that we are not working as a collective common vision, that it should be that everything uh, we need to uh, embody. And that's the, the, the element that I, that I wanna share right now because I don't wanna go over the, the time but is it's, it's to throw this into the dialogue and the conversation is how do we maintain balance by creating those relationships and networks of uh, living in with a common vision, a collective vision where we honor ourselves as, as human beings in this earth and, and in this life. Thank you so much, Baba Lao Joseph. And now I have the honor of also presenting Imama Sumaya Solel, from the Islamic tradition and the founder of the Islamic Society of Puerto Rico and the Caribbean. She is also the co-founder of the Colectivo Interreligioso de Mujeres, Interreligious Women's Network, and the first state licensed Muslim woman marriage official in the Caribbean. Sumaya. It's be upon you all and thank you for this invitation. I have been enjoying the, the presentation of my brothers. Um, the Prophet Muhammad say, said, the believer will be a new type of human being, a new creation that now makes a commitment to the social justice project in the land of God and does not ascribe under any circumstance to any form of injustice she or he will fight until the end to establish a just society. He or she will not harbor any fear nor refrain from denounce or face any unjust law nor the most ferocious tyrant. This will exemplify the best of jihads. This is, this is 
practically, uh, this statement embodies what Islam stands for, the responsibility of the believer towards social justice. Faith as an undeniable commitment to what is right and just for everyone. Social justice is the real main pillar of the Islamic practice. There are two major subjects that when we look at Islamic societies and communities, we see a clear contradiction to this important pillar of social justice and is women's rights and LGBT, LGBTQ rights. A story after story, we have found more than 8,000 biographies of women scholars in Islam. Many uh, of the main scholars have in their records been taught by women. And they had, many of the scholars have spoken openly uh, about their women scholars who, who taught them. We have to understand that Islam originates in a very, a tribal patriarchal society. And many of the statements of the Quran regarding women as girls or wives or widows are related to the protection, to protecting them from the injustice in these pre-Islamic societies. The discussion of women in what we call domestic space, even the task of childcare and cooking are not mentioned anywhere in Islamic as Islamic obligations for women, not even in the Quran. The Quran speaks about the right to, the, the earn, to earn property, to do business, to inherit, the right to be leaders, heads of state. The same, uh, it has the same statement regarding religion obligations for men and women. Uh, we see uh, in the story of the prophet, many women fighters and companions of the prophet uh, demanding and women demanding rights for themselves uh, on top of rights of men uh, in public, discussions in public. If we talk about the LGBT uh, community uh, in Islamic societies, there is no talking about this at all. And there is no discussion about this subject in the first 300 or 400 years after the death of the prophet. There is no account of the prophet uh, speaking uh, in terms of punishment or that he disliked any behavior that could be even related remotely to, to, to this, to homosexuality or lesbian, transgender, anything of that. The only thing that we have is a, is a um, confirmed uh, narration of the prophet and an authentic in which he is telling his companions to tell this transgender woman that used to spend time with other Muslim women and she, and she will be in uh, spaces related specifically and private for women. They told, he told her that she could no longer be with them, not because she was transgender, it was because she will bring the conversations that were private of women, she, she will tell about it to men. And this was the reason, the only reason what she was uh, forbidden to be, uh, spend more time with these women. It was not an issue at all about being transgender. And, and, the, and this narration only points out that she was transgender because of why, why she was in this space that was declared for women and then she went to the other space that was for men. So this means she could go from one side to the other with no problem. Nobody had an issue with it. And she was just forbidden to being with the woman's side just because she was telling the secret. So this is the only, the only uh, account that we have related uh, uh, to this. But uh, also in Islamic law, in Islamic law, the rules about punishment of sodomy uh, come much later, but they were in the context of, of uh, anal penetration as an act of violence or rape, uh, not in the context of homosexuality. This was not what the punishment was intended to, because this was not even a discussion in the Muslim world at all. So when we look at, at, at Islamic societies and community, communities now, and we put these two points, and after what we can find in literature, we say, what happened? What happened in Islam with these two things? What colonization happened? And, uh, and, and this is, this, this, all this discussion started 
to emerge in Islamic literature after many of Muslim majority countries were colonized by different uh, countries from, uh, from Europe, we cannot take away the fact that this, many of these societies were patriarchal societies. But the Islamic explanation or justification of, 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 of women as second, as second class, it was never in Islam until this point. And then we started to, to, to see uh, all these writings and interpretation of scholars regarding what is to be a woman, what is to be a man, and what is to be not fitting into any of those two things. And then we started to see the definition of what a family is as a, something that will flow between societies so much and will be so different because we're talking about a, a, a practically one third of the world or a little more. So we, we are across countries, across cultures, across time. And suddenly we started to see a one very particular definition and it didn't make any sense in the, in the Muslim world, but this was being imposed as, as, the, as, as the rule within Islam to be, to be implemented in all Islamic societies would make no sense at all. But is this project, is, is this problem of colonization uh, that had very uh, important influence in many uh, universities and uh, Islamic universities like Al-Assad University in Egypt and other Islamic knowledge centers like in Syria and Lebanon and, and ultimate in Saudi Arabia, India and Pakistan. And then all these scholars came together in these scholar councils and they were coming together to put uh, this uh, and articulate something uh, more coherent, but in the same line uh, that had all this mentality that they, we were, that was so alien to Islamic societies and is what we have today as a mainstream Islam. And this is what we have inherited from colonization uh, in, the, in what we call the real Islam that is, has been brought all over, all over the world and has been imposed to us like the religion that we practice, which is, is very far away from what it really is. Now, uh, this, this also gets a little bit more complicated because now we have uh, uh, the situation in the Middle East and we have many countries in the Middle East that become very powerful and the politics of the Middle East become part of, 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 of how we articulate Islam. And we have a country like Saudi Arabia uh, making their own colonization to come into different countries of Latin America and bringing their own book of Islam, of what Islam is and how it should be, and how Islam uh, is supposed to be transform a culture and politics in everywhere they go. So it, uh, we have Saudi Arabia making, investing more than $50 million in the mosque of Argentina, which is one of the biggest mosques in Latin America. And then we have, uh, we have them also in the big mosque of Mexico. And then we have them making this uh, enormous, uh, very expensive uh, temples and making this investment in developing uh, uh, religious texts in Spanish, all these translations that are being handpicked to, to go according to this particular ideology within Islam. So we have a colonization and another colonization, our mosque in, uh, in the Caribbean and in Latin America are colonized spaces. You go to a mosque in Puerto Rico, a Caribbean country, and it is a colonized space. You enter and they speak a foreign language. They have another way of dressing. The old manner, mannerism or all the, the, the behavior in the place is completely alien to any Caribbean or Puerto Rican. Uh, uh, what you hear, sounds, smells, how the space is divided, all this has no relation to us as Caribbean people is, 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 is very alien to us and is a colonized space. You as a convert, uh, you are viewed as a second class citizen because you don't fit naturally into that, regardless that you are Muslim as well. And we have this thing that Dr. Sam Cruz mentioned uh, when, when, when somebody from position of power takes over to another that, that goes 
on the, underneath and, and how this, this go into an imposition. Well, we have the Christians uh, here in Puerto Rico bringing us Catholic, uh, Catholicism and also making us protest in a way, right? We have these two I mean, these two uh, stages, one with the Spanish and then with the United States. We have been calling at least from both. But now in, in terms of uh, the context of the Islamic society here, then we have a third round of, col of colonization from the Arabs. And uh, when, we, when we become, when Puerto Rican people become Muslims, they are in a lot of trouble because now we go into another colonizer that are the Arabs, that are on top of us, telling us what is right, what is wrong, how, how do we live? And we have very limited access to the sacred text because the sacred texts have been translated by them and not necessarily the translations are very accurate. So it's, it's a, we have export, they, they have put into us so much that we don't know anymore uh, what, what is right for us because it doesn't fit us. It is it's very, it's very difficult to go. And one very important thing that we should do as a way to rescue, rescue ourselves and rescue our society is something that Joseph Carroll say is go back to, 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 to go to the past. What was before all this? Go back to the basics. And when we see how people related before, uh, this was not an issue and it was more simpler and people could, could go by these basic principles that he brought in his presentation that are so important and common into our religions. So why this commonality cannot be it? Why does it have to, so many things to go on top and make us even different? We have, I had many conversations with uh, uh, Dr. Carroll and uh, me asking him uh, to teach me about his religion and our conversations have been incredibly enlightening because I have seen myself as a Muslim in his own religion. And uh, when I speak uh, to, to Christians and Buddhists and we talk about what is the, the most important thing or the pillars or, or what, what the matrix of the religion is the matrix of my religion too. So I think the colonization process have done a big damage uh, making all these small boxes where they have put every one of us and where we have put ourselves into when we label our religious in a way because this, um, this also forces us, you know, with, because when we talk about religion, uh, we, we are talking, what, what do we need? We need a building, we need uh, people to gather, we need a book or some kind of something written that we can follow. We need a male leader. We need, you know, we, we have some things that even when we go from one religion to the other, we are expecting to, to find it in the other place. So to be able to decolonize our, our practice, we have to go back to something much, much, much simpler. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sumaya, Iman Sumaya. And now, uh, I'm also happy to present uh, Her Majesty Queen Mother Duwati, who is the ambassador of the Grand Council of Voodoo, Ruendo Benin, as a high priest in Haitian Voodoo. She founded the Afro-Atlantic Theologies and Treaties Institute, ATI. Welcome, Mother Duwati. Thank you. Um, in our tradition, we have a call and uh, response. So when I say the word honor, you say the word respect, please. So honor, respect, honor, respect, honor, respect. honor. respect. 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 Thank you. I'm grateful to uh, the organizers. Um, uh, I'm delighted to be here and to have this opportunity to speak with all of you. Um, I feel like I've been waiting my whole life to have this conversation <laughs> in some ways. Um, uh, but uh, my whole life has also been about decolonizing spaces of our tradition. I'm a Mambo Asogwe, a high priest in Haitian voodoo, and I've always had a fairly unorthodox approach to, um, to dealing with uh, our tradition and, and how it's, it's practiced. I'm going to go through a, a quickly a, a PowerPoint presentation that will let you know how I have been doing uh, that work. 
um, uh, both per personally and uh, through the Afro-Atlantic Theologies and Treaties Institute, uh, AT, but in a, a word as um, both someone who is a, a high priest in the tradition and a postmodern uh, human geographer, a scholar of that discipline, um, and someone who has done a lot of work on monuments and memorials of the transatlantic slave trade wars, or the Ma'afa, um, my, my relationship with, with our religions, with our faiths, has been um, about uh, you know, creating spatial justice and, and reclaiming the spaces that have been taken away from, from us in various ways. So I'm going to do screen share. You know, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Yang started out with what, what we are. I'm going to start out with what we are not, because if there's any tradition that has been vilified um, over and over and over again, if you know nothing about uh, voodoo, you know plenty about voodoo with the four O's. And voodoo is the father of crass imaginations. It's filled with ignorance. It's filled with racist constructs. It is about debilitating the African person's um, a relationship with the, the divine um, and, and consuming our spaces, our sacred spaces, consuming our imaginations, um, uh, uh, minimalizing it or, or shrinking it um, as it expands the, 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 the facile transmission of an ugly message of Afrophobia, a fear of African um, uh, spiritual practices, African sensibilities, African people. And that has been done most successfully in the, the past several decades uh, by means of books, films, video, television, and media. Uh, even recently, I just received uh, this morning um, this image of Marvel Comics, who is going to create an image called Brother Voodoo because they want to uh, expand or, or, or um, explore, excuse me, African spirituality in this form. Um, so the nature of our narratives, um, even as we speak, uh, continue to be uh, compromised and uh, still somehow in the, in the realm of control of, of others. What Voodoo is, V-O-D-O-U, is a healing-centered, eco-theological philosophy. And I want to emphasize the eco-theological piece of it, um, that we are conscious of the world that is around us, uh, that our spiritual movements, our habits happen in relationship to um, uh, the, 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 the planets, to the heavens, where the moon, the earth, it, where the, the, the sun, the moon, the earth are situated. Um, we are constantly aware of that. We are aware of what season that we are in, what time of day that it, we are in, and, and therefore the nature of the behaviors that we should be uh, ideally engaged in, as well as the space here we are in with each other. And that's why I started out um, in our tradition with the words honor and respect, honor and respect. We are sharing a space together, and um, we must honor and respect one another while we are in this, in, the, in this space, in this plane, in this universe. So Voodoo provides us with a basis for sustaining and transmitting the wisdom and the intelligence of our ancestors um, into sacred rites. Uh, Voodoo consists of two words uh, from the foreign language, vo, which means um, peace and do for the, the search, the incessant search for it. So we're constantly looking for peace, constantly looking for peace, which is clearly a contradiction to what has been uh, the, 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 the myths, uh, the misgivings that have been put out there about uh, the tradition. Um, so voodoo is the foundation of the moral and ethical standards that we uphold as African descendants. Its intellectual and spiritual framework teaches and advocates a self-sufficient, democratic, equalitarian, and egalitarian way of living that holds each member of the community uh, accountable for his or her actions. In our traditions, we understand that um, that all space is, is, is sacred, that we must aim for what is um, you know, the, the highest aspect of our being and that we must unfold like a spatial uh, spiritual origami, every nook and cranny to find 
what will keep us in a state of balance of peace. And peace is everything from human security, um, having um, adequate food to eat, shelter, clothing, um, uh, the access to, 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 to freedom, to, to, to happiness, the right to vote. Um, among the things that I have been doing in my search for, for peace is to reclaim the spaces that had been taken away from us through colonization, um, uh, reclaiming the territories, spiritual and artistic, linguistic. And I started that process in, in earnest by bringing uh, His Majesty Dada Dagbo Huna Huna the second, who is the Supreme Chief of Wudu Edo. Uh, I brought him to an Agwe ceremony um, uh, in New York. So here we're looking at how Voodoo on both sides of the Atlantic um, have uh, been unified and this process continues. But part of what I've also been doing um, is because I, you know, you know, bringing people together is all good and well, but they have to come together for a purpose. And for me, the purpose is, is beyond the ceremonial. Um, so um, a public policy recommendations and community meetings um, have been organized by the ATI and the Société Minoka in Louisiana. Uh, the Société Minoka is the house that I have inherited with the passing of my late father, Papa Fanfan Damas. And, um, and in it, uh, we brought together um, uh, interfaith, interreligious uh, uh, meetings with spiritual leaders, um, um, you know, including uh, the, the Black Indian crews, uh, part of, of the reason for doing this was because we were addressing the marginalization of African descendant communities in, in NOLA and the economic disparities between blacks and whites, the issue of racism, colorism, Afrophobia. Um, you know, it is something that is internalized and it, 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 uh, uh, we, we, we penalize ourselves for being who and what we are. Um, as well as being penalized by those who want to take over our spaces and, um, and are embracing our traditions. So there, there's, a, there's an initial colonization that took place and then there's a secondary or tertiary one that continues to occur. Um, part of the work that I've been doing with Dada has been, and, and this is directly related to my, uh, uh, my scholarship, uh, is, is ritual cleansing at sites of trauma. Um, so we have on one hand, Shakto Bottom, um, uh, we're doing a ritual at night along a pier where Africans entered clandestinely um, into, into Richmond so that the good white folks couldn't see um, uh, the, 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 the horrible conditions that they, that they were in. And so we were doing um, rituals at night. We went to the site of the Cotilda slave ship on the Alabama River. Uh, shortly after it had been confirmed that in fact the, um, the remains of that ship had been found. So he and I and, and a hoodoo priest, uh, well, a hoodoo practitioner um, uh, performed ceremonies to, to cleanse that space. Um, in some ways, my life in the past uh, more than 20 years has been about uh, mainstreaming voodoo uh, with my own uh, uh, personal growth and development. Uh, this is an image of me at the uh, Interfaith Center Civil Leadership Academy. It was uh, not quite our graduation, but it was the end of the term of our program in 2018. And, um, and I continue to do uh, formal training and education in interfaith studies um, and activism. Uh, uh, I started as a cohort of Faith in New York, and it is now culminated in um, a doctorate from the New Seminary in Interfaith Studies. Um, and when I return to Benin next week, uh, I'll actually be getting more involved in a national interfaith, uh, interfaith platform of confessional religions. As a human rights activist, the issue of Afrophobia has been keen to me. And so and on world stages, such as the Organization of the American States at the United Nations, um, here at a summit for the International Decade for People of African Descent, uh, you see me uh, with practitioners of not only voodoo, but uh, 
Kumfa, um, uh, uh, Rastafari, and uh, in Christianity. Um, we were at a meeting um, in Guyana, Georgetown, Guyana in 2018. And there I spoke about where do we need to go spiritually? Um, um, what should we uh, be doing? How should we be thinking about ourselves? How should we be redefining our humanity? What concrete legal actions have to be taken, um, such as having treaties among our various nation states, the nations of Ogun, the nations of Yemoja, the nations of Ezulid, the nations of Ishu, what we often think of as um, uh, Egbe, you know, but those kind of nation, the nation Gede. Um, we as African peoples who are inherently transnational um, and have always been transnational in our thinking and in our being, um, uh, you know, the issue of hospitality and, and openness and mutuality, uh, the, the construct of Ubuntu um, has, has, uh, has been talked about. And so that continues to reflect itself in many ways. But I feel strongly that we need to get to a point where we are actually uh, coming together to create um, uh, not only uh, bodies and spaces of interaction, but trees that reinforce um, uh, uh, not so much beliefs, but, uh, but policies that should be in place that are going to protect us against um, uh, Afrophobia, protect us against xenophobia, protect us against um, uh, uh, homophobia in our communities, but also allow us to benefit and make use of our own sacred medicines, such as marijuana, uh, uh, ibogaine, and, and, and other uh, sacred drugs or, or medicines that are deemed illegal uh, in the global north because they haven't quite figured out how to profit from what we do um, uh, and, and, and take out the spiritual part of it, um, but they prevent us from being who we are and, and practicing our, our traditions as, as we must. Um, so, uh, and the last two, well, the last few images will focus on um, edu educating people, uh, educating leaders and educating children or the youth on both sides of the Atlantic. So when Dada, who is my partner is here, I make sure that he goes to places like the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, um, uh, such as the, the, the Whitney uh, uh, Slavery uh, mu Museum to these sites of trauma so that he, and other African leaders who, and spiritual leaders in particular, understand what the nature of our experience was in the Americas. That's another piece of the decolonization process. What's going on um, uh, in the scholarship and the education and the understanding of who we and the, the, the diaspora are um, historically, spiritually, um, uh, and, 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 and otherwise. And then um, working with youth, uh, I, I am in the Mid-Hudson Valley. Uh, one of the things that I agreed to do um, uh, was to uh, teach young people about um, uh, the oceans, about water, because that is part of what defines um, uh, our crown at the Juno House, um, uh, being associated as uh, Her Majesties of, the, of the, the, the ocean and the seas. So teaching about uh, water, as a spiritual phenomena, as a cultural phenomena, as a as, as a uh, you know scientific uh, 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 element or things that we did, I was working with um, my sister, uh, my sister queen, literally my four, um, uh, teaching these young children about um, African dances that relate to water. And then my favorite is having a drapeau, which is a, a voodoo flag um uh surrounded by these you know mostly white suburban kids um and they're learning about voodoo early on so that when they get older they are not fearful of of what it is they have a clearer and better understanding of what voodoo means um and lastly on the other side of the atlantic the uh the children of the voodoo Huedo school uh whom uh i am uh, rebuilding and securing financial support to rebuild the school using Voodoo's uh, principles. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sharing images of them. Uh, these are young people who are already learning ethnobotany. They are already learning the fa as part of their day-to-day -day understanding of day-to-day of, uh, of -day education, right? But yet they don't have electricity in the school. They don't have access to technology. Um, and so uh, working in partnership with uh, local uh, leaders and uh, leaders in uh, 
you know, overseas here in the Americas and elsewhere is part of how um, I personally am seeking to continue to decolonize our spaces so that digital uh, and uh, historical and, and, and uh, metaphysical and other divides cease to exist. I'm reclaiming those spaces. Thank you so much, Thank Queen you. Mother Dawati. Thank you so much for your presentation. And now we have uh, Reverend Nilka Marrero. I don't see Nilka's uh, image. Um, Nilka is a, a, a Methodist pastor. She's the mother of four children. She has a, a master's degree in, in history and a master's degree in theology. And she also has a JD, she's a lawyer. Um, and she's just a fascinating woman who's doing fascinating work in Barrio Obreros, Puerto Rico, an immigrant uh, community, an immigrant community from all immigrants from all over the world that show up there in, in Barrio Obrero. And we're happy to have us with us. Uh, I'm just going to ask the last four presenters to please stay within the time frame so that the audience can have a time for dialogue with all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Cruz. It's an honor being with all of you um, tonight. And uh, as past, as Dr. Cruz has said, I am a woman pastor of a Christian community who lives its faith in the margins where we have a powerfully marked by the experience of a very traumatic borderland. Because it's from these borderlands that we speak with our communities, with those who participate and come from the Abrahamic beliefs and those who come also from the Caribbean, Latin African experience, but not to leave them out. We also have the experience of speaking with the Wicca community that exists in Puerto Rico since the turn of the 19th century. Uh, we have a sector in our island, it's El Sector Los Brujos, and um, yeah. I wish anthropologists and uh, people that do these studies would go over there and give them a good visit. Um, decolonize needs to, that we have to recognize in the first place, our political and economic experience in the Caribbean. And I'm, I'm trying to immerse Puerto Rico, its process of decolonization as a Caribbean experience, not as a distal island that lives in between the Atlantic and the Caribbean. And uh, this experience, of being so isolated marks us as the divided ones. We are, as uh, Iman Sumaja has mentioned, we have been divided. Living life in the hostile colonized borders bring us to the urgent need to establish friendships between our islands, our different cultures, and our different beliefs. In the borderlands, we have to insist, as I've done in the past in my church, that we have to pull, like Francis Panon says, our white masses to see our black faith and our black beliefs of our ancestors. You see me with this hair and you may think that I am white, but I am the, um, granddaughter, great-granddaughter of a liberated slave, Maria Librada. So that is part of my heritage. That is part of my family. It's part of the way I see life. I bring to you tonight that we have to de decolonize communication. Our response to dialogue, our response to sharing you are very, very colonized. We are situated in the Caribbean and we are surrounded by 7,000 islands, some that are not that occupied. 
And we do not embrace our geographical context of the almost 27 nations, I believe, um, that live around and surround us. In the Caribbean, we have different ways of speaking. We have different lang languages, but we are hesitant to communicate with the others when we idealize our Spanish colonized um, upbringing and language. We turn our backs sometimes to that 15% 50, 15 of the 38 million people that live in the Caribbean. So in my church, I have people that come from St. Keith's. And when liturgy is done, I let them sing in their own tongue, the tongue of their ancestors, the tongue that they remember the way they can embrace their faith and have an encounter. Sometimes I feel that Puerto Rico, we are tra still traveling in our journeys and our different paths, uh, like the slaves that came in different ships divided on purpose, that spoke different tongues so they could not communicate and we were separated. And we, in the same way, are separated today of those Afro-Atlantic realities. Language has fallen as an instrument to divide us and to keep us impoverished and conquered. We do not speak. We are the divided ones that do not speak. I am adopting the image of the scholar Michael Ross Poulot, uh, the Haitian scholar. And um, I state the possibility tonight of the religious world willing and able to speak other languages. I'm speaking of heteroglossia, where we can understand different languages and different religious experience that will open different spaces and understanding the hybridizing encounters of people, culture, and space. Decolonizing our encounters means that we have to seek paths of communication and participation. We do not speak. Consuls have to write my Christian faith, uh, redefined what is the interreligious dialogue to include this type of dialogue. We usually talk with the Jewish, with Buddha, people from Islam, but we do not want to talk and we do not invite, as Dr. Sam Cruz has stated early, people that live or those popular religions that live in the margins of our society. And that has stopped us for growing and getting out of that colonized mentality that keeps us separated one away from the other. And we lose strength in those margins when we cannot speak and we cannot deal then with strength and power with the important issues of life like racism, global warming. We cannot talk about the uh, politics of immigration and all of us have faiths that have come because of, of the process of migration, but we cannot deal with it as a group, as a community of people looking for social justice. We um, live in the margins and something that I sometimes feel I don't feel proud of is of that exclusion. Around two or three years ago, we had an encounter in a very important church. And uh, the reverend there of this, uh, we had an encounter of faith, different faith, had invited Dr. Jose Alberto Han, who is a Babalao. And the reaction 
of the community of our commun Christian community of faith was adverse because how could it be possible that a high priest, a high priest that came from the Baba Lao tradition could occupy a seat and talk from the altar. We have to surrender those ideas of that European fraught where we are um, understanding religion. Um, and we demonize and we use the book of Exodus. Um, you shall not permit the female saucer to live. So it's very, 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 um, we have to understand that we are still using those phrases under a very bad interpretation when women usually, what they do is to uh, give consolation to the afflicted. We dehumanize the frontiers of encounter, legitimizing forces of oppression that we brought, that are brought through our migrant faith. Now, maybe a faith that practice solidarity with one who is different will help us understand this. And I am thinking in our sacred book, in the Gospel of Luke, that we have a parable of the Samaritan man who did not share the beliefs of the people of God. And that was the one that was thrown, thrown violently ill. And um, this summer, I mean, there was a man and uh, the Samaritan came who did not share the beliefs of that man who was uh, thrown and violently ill in the crossroads. And um, that man got off his horse and that man cleansed him with oil and wine. wine. And maybe this is the time in these crossroads that Christianity has to open to the experience um, to let us be, to perceive us ourselves as the violently, violently ill that have to be cured by the others that are the ones that are here around me, surrounding me tonight. Good evening. Thank you so much, Reverend Guerrero. Thank you so much. And now we have, I have the honor to present Dr. Joshua Samuel, who is the visiting lecturer for theology, global Christianity and mission at the Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theological Seminary, New York. His research focuses on the subtle and complex intersections of caste, race and colonialism in the field of interreligious engagement through a post-colonial Dalit perspective. Thank you, Dr. Cruz. I don't so see, I, oh, there he goes, okay, there okay. you go. <laughs> so uh, my presentation basically consists of two parts. First, I will give a brief overview of who Dalits are and, uh, and about Dalit traditions. Dalit religious tradition set within the context of the Indian subcontinent. Second, I will observe some of the colonial traits of interreligious dialogue and point out how Dalit traditions seek to disrupt these trends. For the sake of those who are unfamiliar, the word Dalit, which means broken or crushed, refers to those communities that are discriminated as outcasts by the caste system. Caste, again, for those who are not familiar, is a hierarchical social practice that has its roots in the ancient sacred texts of India, which was later consolidated and rigidified during the British colonial period. While earlier caste thrived explicitly as a functional system, in the 21st century, it survives both in overt and subtle forms. In fact, violence against Dalits has increased considerably with the rise of Hindu nationalism. Last month, when a 19-year-old Dalit woman was raped and killed by dominant caste men, the cops and the state officials, rather than taking action against the culprits, 
burnt her body in the middle of the night to cover up the case. While this is happening in India, caste practice and discrimination against Dalits is also happening across the globe, including the US. It is in this context that we need to consider the significance of Dalit religious traditions. Dalit traditions refer to a wide range of traditions that are practiced, though not exclusively, by Dalit communities. At present, Dalit traditions are treated as a part of Hinduism. But until the late 19th century, neither Dalits nor their traditions were treated as Hindus by upper caste. No wonder then some Dalit leaders and scholars argue that Dalits cannot be considered as Hindus. Nonetheless, we can say that Dalit traditions are both continuous with and distinct from Hindu Hinduism. That is, even if they do not, if, even if they do, do show similarities with the dominant Hindu traditions, including the Sanskritic Brahmanic traditions, that is those traditions that assert the superiority of the Brahmin communities, Dalit traditions do have some unique features. So let me name a few here. First, Dalit communities, uh, first Dalit deities are geographically segregated from the dominant caste space. Second, many of the Dalit deities are based on stories of people who had suffered and experienced violence in the past. Third, these myths are remembered and reinterpreted by Dalit communities as stories of resistance and liberation to navigate through their oppression and suffering. Fourthly, Dalit religious spaces are not conventional and often exist in the open space as earth-based traditions. Fifthly, in Dalit traditions, divine possessions, that is uh, a deity coming upon a devotee, are a primary way of experiencing the divine. Finally, hybridity and multiple religious belonging are a common feature in Dalit communities, since in general, Dalit worldview draws from and weaves together multiple religious traditions. Now let me turn to the Dalit critique of the colonial roots and traits of interreligious dialogue. Firstly, Dalit traditions challenge the primacy of texts in dialogue spaces. That is, in most interreligious engagements, there is a prioritization of text-based traditions. It is worth noting that this text centrism actually goes back to the days of Orientalism and colonialism when textual traditions were seen as superior and elevated as world religions. However, as Tomoko Mazutsawa points out, the elevation of these text-based world religions was just another way of reinforcing Euro-Christian supremacy. Thus, in the words of Marianne Moyat, when texts are prioritized, lurking around the corner is the problem of Christianization of religion. Being predominantly oral in nature, Dalit traditions call for the need to go beyond texts in understanding religion and insist on engaging in people-centered and community-centered, and in fact, body-centered interreligious learning. Secondly, Dalit traditions also challenge the compartmentalization and centralization of religions. Post-colonial scholars like Brent Nongpri have pointed out that the understanding of religion as a rigidly compartmentalized private sacred space is actually a modern development. That is the view that each religion has a mutually exclusive space that is totally different and separate from the rest happened as a result of European colonial policies to understand and categorize the native colonial subjects. This view also assumed that each religion, each little space, compartmentalized space, had its own central teaching that governed and policed the lives of the entire religious group. A classic example here is how the Bhagavad Gita, no doubt a beautiful ancient Sanskrit Hindu text, was projected as the Bible of the Hindus. Of course, in reality, this is not true. Many lower caste Hindus 
would not even have heard of the Sanskrit book simply because it was not their language and they had no way of knowing that, learning that language. No wonder then that Dalit traditions are quite different from Hindu traditions that are based on Sanskrit texts. Another good example is eating beef. While Brahmins and some upper castes insist that cow is a sacred animal that should not be slaughtered, for Dalits and many lower caste communities, beef has been their staple diet for centuries. So a simplistic, compartmentalized understanding of religion and interreligious dialogue fails to recognize these nuances. Finally, Dalit traditions challenge interreligious dialogue to prioritize justice and the voices of the oppressed. Often, because interreligious dialogue is such an exciting endeavor, the element of power is not acknowledged. Interreligious dialogue can thus easily become sort of a pleasant and pleasant but power-centered learning space where powerless voices are ignored and issues of injustice and oppression are overlooked. In that sense, interreligious dialogue could become a silent means of con condoning and perpetuating hierarchies. Of course, this is again an old trait of colonialists who always gravitated toward power and generally wanted, generally upheld and deepened existing social hierarchies. Interreligious dialogues, in that sense, reproduce unconsciously perhaps the old colonial power dynamics. Peniel Rajkumar, an, an Indian theologian, notices that this often happens in Indo-Christian dialogue, dialogue spaces where caste issues are overlooked, raising the doubt if dialogue has become part of the conspiracy that ignores the sufferings of Dalits and other marginalized communities. In this context, Dalit traditions seek to disrupt such politic, politics of invisibilization by forcing interreligious dialogue to be accountable to the cause of justice and liberation of the oppressed. Thus, Dalit religious traditions, like those of other marginalized communities that we have been hearing this evening, play a critical role in decolonizing and challenging caste and Western supremacy that continues to be a problem in interreligious engagement spaces. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua. And now quickly, I want to present Alex Lasaya Tata Nindi Bilongo of the House of Mabiala, Congo, Bejuco, Finda, Bataya, Sacra, Empeño, and specifically belonging to the branch of Malongo Palo known as Mamboye, Manjobe, Manjobe, Manjobe. Sorry, Alex. Mayombe. Mayombe, Mayombe. Um, well, good evening. I am Tata Nindi Bilongo, uh, Alex Lasaye of the Mayombe House of Mabiala, Congo, right, for short. I've uh, been initiated now for 26 years in the Cuban Congo religious system of Makisinsi Malongo, or also known as Palo. Uh, Makisinsi Malongo was born in the kingdom of the Congo out of the ancient initiatory schools of thought known as Kimba, Kimpasi, Kindembo, and Lemba. And during the transatlantic slave trade, millions of people uh, from the Congo Kingdom were enslaved, including many of those initiated into these very societies, and they were scattered throughout the Americas. Um, in Cuba, by the early 1600s, those who were able to escape slavery began grouping together um, in small maroon communities, and by the beginning of the 1700s, these small maroon communities began to form larger mutual aid societies, and these societies were found primarily in the mountains of Pinal de Rio, um, and in the countryside of the Havana province. And by the first decade of the 1800s, one of the earliest, if not the first organized munansos or houses of Palo was formed and, and given the name of Sacarampeño to be removed from hawk, to be removed from loan, um, the Sacar de Empeño. And the leader was a young Maroon initiate um, by the name of Juan Cabanga, Cabanga Yerecun. Through ceremonies, kutuwangos, which are folk tales, and most importantly, through sacred words and songs known as mambos, um, initiates were taught their sacred ancestral ways. And just by doing so, was acting as 
uh, in a direct opposition to the colonial way of life, which in its very essence promotes um, the subjugation of people and the ethnic and or racial hierarchy or superiority of the colonizer um, over the colonized. And so the very first lesson is taught to, uh, to new initiates of Malongo include something that's called Cortesia Congo, um, which teaches us how to respect one another as members of the same house, how to respect others who hail from other houses and other traditions where their ceremonies and customs may differ from ours. Also how to defend our right to exist and be always in remembrance that freedom is a divinely imbued right. We are taught to be defenders of the earth and soldiers of Yamponda Munansambe, uh, which is the translation of what we would understand as mother nature, right? And that we must live in balance with the creator's ultimate law maker known as Malongo. Malongo translates to nature. This in itself defies the very essence of, colonial, of, of colonialism and colonization, which is that of land domination and the exploitation of its resources. Um, through the belief in a myriad of spirits of nature like the Enkita, which are the spirits of those who died um, tragic deaths, um, in Cuyo, those who didn't live a very righteous life, um, Bakulu, those who are elevated ancestors, those who did manage to live a righteous life, um, Basimbi, which are guardians of particular points of nature, um, Sambe and Mpungu, which are elevated ancestors who have attained the level of, um, of forces of nature, right, which is considered to be a great thing. Uh, we learn to live in balance with nature and the ancestral world. And we remember that we are part of an eternal energy, right, that it unites us all and, and to go against nature is to go against the divine. These lessons taught by our elders and by the elders of each Munanso, each house, allow us to continue the preservation of our ancestral Congo traditions in the midst of oppression, like during the transatlantic slave trade, where our people were um, subjugated under a life of imposed servitude using violent acts of terrorism under the guise of Christianity at the hands of Mundele, European colonizers. The Bakongo were very clear in understanding the differences between being Bafiote, black-skinned, Mamputo, being of mixed race, um, which included light-skinned blacks, mulatos, and those mixed black folk who today would be considered passing, and Mundele, white European, and understood very well the privileges or lack of carried by each one. And with this being understood, uh, originally initiation was reserved primarily for Bafiote, those of black skin, and Mamputo, those of mixed um, race, right, or ethnicities. And up until the 1970s, only a handful of Mundeles were known to have been initiated, and it is said that only after many years of them proving to be an ally to uh, the black cause, which that word black cause has a, has a name, it's called Candombe, uh, which is also the very similar to the candomble name used in, in the Brazilian religion, Afro-Brazilian religion. And candomble just means it's a black thing, right? Um, the religious houses or munansos were organized as mini governments and militias. Um, and there, the initiated officers who hold rank within those houses are known as oficio congo, each with their own role and job, which are vital to the cohesion and uh, efficiency of those houses. We are taught to uphold the institution as well as the rights of the individual in order to preserve the community's mukanda, uh, the community's well-being. And the heads of the munanso being the tatinkisi and the yayankisi are responsible for the enforcement of these rules. Um, and a person was initiated only after they were found worthy because of their character, good characters and good morals and loyalty to, um, to the belief system itself and to the people. And just because you were initiated didn't automatically mean you would be taught. Um, that had to be earned. Uh, the vetting process was, was always very intense and necessary for the preservation of these Congo traditions and the integrity of it as well. And all these teachings allowed the Congo system of Makisinsi Malongo uh, to survive and flourish in the face of colonialism. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and now we have last but not least, 
Maria Terrero has been working as a cultural activist performer of Afro-Dominican traditional music and dance since 1987. She is er also an early childhood educator through art and culture. Maria was among the founding members of the music ensemble La Veintiuna División and later joined the all-female Dominican Puerto Rican ensemble Yaya and later founded Cumba Carre. After Maria's presentation, we'll open it up to the audience. Um, and I'm pretty sure we're gonna have a good time. Maria. Last but not least. Um, thank you. Um, so my presentation will focus on La 21 División, which is the, uh, um, the belief system in the Dominican Republic. It is the driving force at the core of the foundation of the syncretic belief system practiced in the Dominican Republic at all levels of society where Catholicism is the official religion. The essence of voodoo, of introspection into the mystery and honoring of our ancestors is present in La Ventuna División's extended and diverse practice in the country. Yet, voodoo is still taboo and many practitioners carry their faith secretly. Also known as La Obra, Los Misterios, Los Seres, Los Luaces, our belief system is a testament of the adaptation and the spreading of voodoo through syncretism. Africans were brought by force to the Americas and in their new environment, they found themselves mixed with many uh, others from tribes throughout Africa with different customs and different languages. And although almost extinct, natives of the new land practiced their own rituals also honoring forces of nature. Trauma, violence, confusion, and the need to survive pretty much illustrate what life was like in those days for those brothers and sisters, our ancestors. Faith held these men and women together and gave them a sense of purpose in the midst of the most atrocious dehumanization. Voodoo priests at the time carried themselves quietly trying to call little attention, but their anger and suffering and the need to express their spirituality got the master's attention, um, thus forcing Africans um, to disguise their practice behind the, the, uh, the images of the new faith imposed by the colonizers, a distorted concept of Christianity. In spite of this, Africans honor the forces of nature and the grand force of creation with an understanding of the connection to the ancestors and life beyond death. Colonies grew and developed on the backs and the exploitation of slaves who were now the new men and women of the colonial world facing lynchings, hangings, and blanching due to their ritual practices. The demonizing of our most sacred spaces and practices extended throughout centuries of social colonization, uh, colonial um, domination into the new republics and until our present days. During the North American occupation of the whole island between 1916 and 1932, burning of drums were rampant in both sides of the island. On the Dominican side, the national military forces requested US soldiers for the assassination of one of the most important uh, spiritual leaders in Dominican history, Olivorio Mateo in San Juan de la Maguana. The systemic massacre of Haitians between 1937 and 1941 by Trujillo lashed close to 18,000 souls in what was known as the Dominicanization of the border with the subsequent creation of towns and military bases aimed at controlling the influx of Haitians and their voodoo practices. In 1962, 20 years after Olivorio's assassination, the killing of Palma Sola annihilated the lives of hundreds of followers of the Liborista movement in Las Matas de Farfán. Just as, the, just as in the traditions of Congo del Espiritu Santo and Sarandunga, the Liborista movement based the rituals on teachings of love and communal life. Today, these communities are a modern day continuation of the Simarronaje, 
the Maroons grouped in free slaves communities known as Manieles. They represent the resilience of our people. Marginalized communities living in unconceivable poverty levels have resisted, maintained, and passed on spiritual practices symbolizing the strength and the immortality of the ancient wisdom of voodoo. 30 years of performing have gradually made me aware of sections in our history unknown through me, unknown to me <laughs> through my childhood, adolescence, and adulthood. Through rhythms like Congo, Sarandunga, Gaga, and Palos, to name some, I've learned about La Ventuna Division. And a real new world has opened in front of my eyes, a new notion of self. A new Dominicanness has come about and brought immense joy and much needed awakening. Through our mysterious Candelo Sedife, Belie Belcan, Anaisa Piedanto, Santa Marta, El Baron del Cementerio, I have come to understand that our connection to the universe, God, the source of all creation, does not and cannot have one way only. I know it seems impossible, but we can undo our colonized behavior. We can celebrate our commonalities and accept our differences. And as two nations sharing a most beautiful island, the Dominican Republic and Haiti, will flourish and eventually cast away hate. Thank you so much, Maria. So now uh, I know we have an audience. I hope you're still with us. We can't see you, but you can see us. And we, Malta and I are gonna uh, field some questions for our panelists. Um, are we ready for that, Naya? And uh, Yes, we are. Um, we have a lively group with us. And so we are just thankful to all of our guests who have joined us tonight. Um, the first question that um, I will read um, to you all, uh, it, it has a little bit of a story behind it. It comes from uh, Oriana on Facebook. Um, and Oriana um, says, recently a friend who belongs to one of these traditions said that she does not believe just anyone can study, can study um, these traditions because they want to or because they are just curious. She believes that it is cultural appropriation or what she refers to, refers to as a colonizing mindset. Um, she went on to state that most African traditions specifically are uh, initiatory, right? There's an initiation process, um, meaning one cannot study them without being licensed to. And that license requires going through a particular set of ceremonies that have been divined uh, upon first that you can even, uh, before you can even receive. Therefore, here's the question, do the panelists agree with this assessment? If so, where is room for others to learn about these traditions in a manner that is respectful and not appropriative, or is that not possible? Well, I think, um, <clears throat> I mean, as moderator, I would direct that particular question to Dr. to Babalao Joseph and to uh, Malta Moreno Vega, herself was a moderator, but I think it, it they're the most, uh, oh, and, and to Queen Mother Duati also. also. So go ahead, Babalao, uh, do you have Babalao Joseph, Dr. Uh, yes, I, I think the uh, part of the reason I think uh, uh, it's a hard question to answer um, because there's a lot of elements that need to be addressed. Um, a lot of it was addressed by the presentation of Alex um, in terms of structure um, and the way of how knowledge it is transmitted. So you, right now with the internet, there's an explosion of information uh, that there's basically no sacred text that is not already open to the public. Uh, that 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 really changed the the old ways of of being part of the community uh, where the uh, initiation element is important because you could uh, you could read all the books that exist but the importance is really the community the mentorship and having uh, elders the ways of of passing on that knowledge passing on that experience 
Um, and this is something not to take up lightly. Uh, we're dealing with a lot of sacred forces that uh, have a very specific ways in order to them to be treated, attended, appeased. And it's, and it's something that if you don't know what you're doing, you should not step into the step into the mix, uh, so to say. Um, I think the doors are opening in the sense that there are certain information that is more accessible to the public, but initiation is extremely important. Uh, we, you cannot separate one thing from the other. And the importance of the initiation, uh, it's, it's, it's a way that you establish a relationship with the Orishas, with Egun, with the ancestors. There's, there's a lot of different ways that you need to know how to do it. And you learn that through the mentorship of, of the elders of uh, Oyalosha, Babalosha, Madrina, Tata, Yaya. Like, all these figures are crucial to making sure that the values and the way of doing things um, are preserved. So it's, it's, it's that balance of uh, there's a lot of knowledge that only people who have the, the strict responsibility and the discipline to use this knowledge is extremely dangerous. So there's a sense of responsibility and ethics. So people really through initiation and devotion really earn the, the knowledge to be passed on. That's why a lot of these traditions is, there's a lot of stuff in books, but not everything's in the books. And, and what gets passed on from generation from generation through the oral tradition is that source of strength that is passed on through the community and what binds that community, what joins that community is that constant process of ceremonies and initiations that go along with that. Mm -hmm. I know uh, fellow brothers and sisters in the panel have a lot more to say along these lines. Um, for sake of time, unless uh, Malta or Queen Mother Duati have something to add to that, I think it was a pretty comprehensive answer. We'll move on to the next question. Malta, you wanna say something? Yeah, I think that um, what the panel has shown is that we need to talk and develop a narrative. It's different uh, when we talk about our belief systems. And I don't use the word religion. I use belief systems because I think that um, automatically religion brings baggage. And a lot of the terminology that's used brings baggage. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to decolonize how we see the sacred, we need to find ways of speaking about it um, that are particular and honor the value systems that we bring and the ethical systems that we bring. And you heard it in all of the panelists, right? How we honor Mother Earth, how we develop a relationship with uh, the community that we are going to be a part of, right? So there is a way that we need to speak differently about these traditions and not believe that you can pick up a book and learn about them, right? Because these are belief systems that take time to develop and relationships that take time to develop. Thank you. Next question. Sure. Our next Thank question you. is from Karen on YouTube and they say, what is the perspective of the global majority towards missionaries, such as the Quakers in Kenya, for example? Uh, Aliu, would you like to uh, take a crack at that? <laughs> you're, you're muted, Aliu. You have to unmute yourself. Yeah, yes, uh, that's a crucial question. What's uh, crucial about this question actually is that colonization, what it did to the continent, it's, uh, it's, it's another story by itself because missionary Christianity has gotten hold of many Africans. In fact, what is sad about it is that as far as I'm concerned, you find in Africa, in some areas of Africa, more fundamentalist Christians than you would find in the US. So deconstructing missionary Christianity would be a long way in dismantling what's happening, not only in Kenya, but also in Senegal. So that is, 
what I think we should do is, again, that's echoes a minute ago in respect to another question. I think we need to consider translation as a key element in the process of deconstructing interreligious dialogue. Translation because life itself and ministry have a linguistic dimension that make them crucial for us to ensure when we engage translation, then the myths that we have in common as people who are colonized, we will be able to navigate through those myths in spite of geographical distances that separate us. When we do so, then we'll be able to confront missionary Christianity. But it's still powerfully grabbing people. I will use Senegal as an example, where it's huge. You talk about even natives insulting their traditional practices because of colonial missionary. So uh, I would say to answer that question is what we can do about that is to focus on translation, specifically those of us, both diaspora and continental Africa, to engage in this conversation of translation because language divided us to begin with. So we can go beyond it and translate because once we translate, we will see common elements and then we'll be able to confront missionary Christianity. I think the political, we have to be really aware as you're stating the political, the political uh, implications of how it works. In Latin America, when liberation theologies came about to decolonize the Christianity brought to Latin America, uh, Pope John Paul II and Reagan worked together to try to eliminate the people who were propagating a more liberative type of Christianity. So the Christianity that comes to third to the global south is usually the worst kind. Mm. Mm. <laughs> is is we, we get the worst of the worst. We get the pollution. Mm. But uh, next question. Of course. So we have a question from um, Alexis Francisco on Facebook. Um, and he says, you know, Fanon wrote, the, wrote that decolonization as a historical process um, sets out to change the order of the world is a program, and, and that is a program of complete disorder. That colonization being violence in its natural state will only yield to greater violence. So they would like to hear what the panelists thoughts on decolonial spirituality um, I'm sorry, on how decolonial, decolonial spirituality traditions can resource efforts to truly decolonize our people. S Sumaya, would you like to take a crack at that? And if I, I can read it again, if, if that would be helpful, I'm sorry. It's okay, it's okay. okay. Um, well, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit complicated because it's, it's, not, it's not a simple answer. Uh, it, 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 it's, it, we are talking about revolution in, in many ways, you know, because how have we been taught to look at the world and relate to it is all very heavily influenced by it. And, and my daughter wanted to talk to. <laughs> and uh, and it, it's she has her own language you know and uh, and it's a little bit it's a little bit complicated because we're talking about revolution can we as can we understand we are the product of that how do we rescue ourselves and how do we recognize that we have a problem because th that that's it and how do we recognize that fixing this and uh, breaking this chains will need a, a lot of violence in many ways. So are we are we up to that? Are we up to that or are we comfortable where we are? So it's, it's a very 
difficult situation right now, we have elections here. And that is, you know, and all these things come into play. Who, how do we see ourselves in the future? How do we project ourselves? Can we really understand that we have a big stone in our heads uh, brought by colonization, double colonization, first from the Spanish and then from, uh, from, from the United States and still here grabbing us? Can, can we see beyond that and, and, and see ourselves? I, I don't really know how to answer that. I think you will, need, you will need people to understand that there is a problem and they were willing to take action to fix that problem and to be able to fix it, you have to start from scratch because there's, there's too much to, to be done and too much to start from because everything has that on top of it. So I, I think I am not, I am not equipped to, to answer this because I would love to know if anybody has some kind of answer for this. Imama, may I ask you, um, from your decolonial perspective and, and the work that you do, as I, I feel is a de um, decolonizing spirituality, how are you present in uh, movements, political social movements like protests? Um, how can we be present in those moments and, and offer decolonization in those moments? Well, you know, something that colonization brings is uh, is unbalanced and is injustice. There's there's no way there's no way that this can can be established unless somebody's being oppressed. So the the simple understanding of what is just and unjust will move you and will give you some guidance on where you have to go. Now, as an as an individual, as a believer. You have a responsibility not only to believe, but to do something about it. Because belief is not something that you have in your heart or in your mind. It has to translate into change. You, as a believer, you're an agent of change. You have to make things happen. And you have to make this love and this justice that we believe and talk about to be something to be real. And for us to do that, which is something simple, it's just... It's just something very basic from any believer that, that, that justice is something very important. You gotta do something about it. So it will have to go beyond prayer, meditation, and something that, in, that will be me by myself. But where I, where I am, because once I recognize my relationship with my creator, how does that expand? It's, it expands from me to my family, which is the immediate people around me, and then my neighbors, which means my community, and then to my country. So if we really understand what our uh, responsibilities as believers, uh, and, and, and when we, we set ourselves as believers, we establish a commitment uh, to that belief that is supposed to move us to mm. do something. And, and we will find a way because you know, people are not uh, standing still, uh, letting all things crush them. People have a voice, they, they move, they try to make change, they try to, you know, people, you cannot bound people into injustice for long, they cannot stand it. And as believers, we have to put ourselves there. Our, our place is not as they taught us to be in this particular space, of four walls in our church and our temples, and that's it. Our faith, it is, 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 is putting us outside in the street and our, and our, and our temple is supposed to be outside mm -hmm. and, uh, and our community is right there needing us. And this is where we have to be. So for us as believers, it's not about uh, for pray, praying and doing meditation as a Muslim. Uh, it's not making the five prayers today. It's not making all these religious obligations that only benefit me. They don't even benefit God. Doesn't God doesn't need uh, prayers? It doesn't mm -hmm. become bigger or smaller because we pray more or no. It, it only benefits us. But where do we go from individual to to something bigger, which is supposed to, you know, be, you know? So mm -hmm. I think it's a natural inclination for a true believer to be an activist and somehow because even the Prophet Muhammad say, if you cannot do something with your mouth. Uh, uh, if you cannot, if you cannot take action and do something with your hands about injustice, just do something with your mouth, denounce and say it that is something unjust. Don't keep silent. But if you not, cannot do it with your mouth, but hate it in your heart. But you should know that this is the least uh, of the beliefs. What does that mean? 
when you believe automatically you will have a sense of what is just and not and this is the least but then you have to progress into into saying something about it and it has to progress into doing something about it so this is very important for us as believers not to only stand quiet and 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 and, and keep it to ourselves because a, a faith is not something necessarily individual it has to project to the outside. It has to reflect in where we live, in our families and in our communities. So I think it's very natural for, for any believer that see that understands what are the commitment that they did to justice uh, to get involved. You, you will see the way easy because people are not quiet and you will find a way to put yourself in, in, into those things. Do we have a next question? Yes, our next question comes from Neonu on Facebook, and they highlight that there are restrictions um, based on labeling religion, saying that that's an inherently colonial term. Um, so what does it mean to center ethical principles and lived experiences? Well, I think that's what everyone spoke about, right? Uh, if we look at our traditions from their ancestral beginnings, right? Uh, they were based on principle. They was based on commonality, based on honoring nature, based on all the principles, right? That we now say are important to our lives. And I, I, I really like the uh, concept of what we do, right? What we do, because, um, with that, uh, doc, doctor said, um, people do, do not understand the word religion. I do not use the word religion to talk about my belief system. We, it's what we do. And uh, ultimately we have to center humanity. We have to center the individual. We have to center life. And at least for myself, when I started actually understanding history and started reading history, religion has always been violent. It has been violent. So that it's like a dichotomy to speak about peace and the religions that we're talking about have been supremacist and violent. An enslaved person was worth more if he was baptized or she was baptized than if she came natural into a, right a, a enslavement. And that's a, a that's a weird word to use, right? But religion made it worth more to be baptized. So from the beginning, it commodified us. We were an economic engine. So for me to use the word religion in any form is contrary to who I am and what our people have experienced. So that centering the individual, which most of our traditions do and the explanation of all of our panelists have said, requires a different way of talking about our belief systems and eliminating and crossing out certain terminology that carries baggage of oppression. Mm -hmm. Aliu. Can I add to this? Uh, thank you so much. There's a, a, a researcher, he's actually an anthropologist, I think, who went to the Jolo people of West Africa. And when, again, I, I, he recorded this in his book. And then he said, when, when he got to the Jolo people, he asked them how they would define a religion. And he said, uh, he was stunned because the Jola elders said to him, um, how long are you staying here? <laughs> and so, and he was stunned because he's asking for a definition and they're asking him a question related to interrelationship. How long are you staying with us? And then uh, he told them, and then they said to him, okay, well, uh, you stay with us and then you'll find out. In essence, he writes that actually what he learned from that experience was this, 
that you have to feel, you have to see, you have to smell, you have to relate. It is lived experience. That's what we do. So you have to go through the rituals and see the rituals, experience them. You can't just sit down and be smart coming with a very strange vocabulary. You have to live what we do. Yes. I also think that to some extent, um, uh, we have to look at the vocabulary, vocabulary that exists within our own traditions, within each other's traditions, have conversations about you know, yes. what they mean, those constructs, and, and borrow from one another to come up with um, the language that we need. But to that end, there is absolutely nothing that stops us um, from um, from creating our own languages. Exactly. <laughs> you, know, you know, we are free. We're sovereign beings. Um, you know, heaven is a massive place, and each and every single one of us is a star, and every star represents a possibility. Um, and 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 that possibility always begins with the word, with the with the power, with the odu. Um, so what is to stop us as humans who are as spirit having uh, you know human experience to have our own odu, to have our own word yes. and, and to reconstruct um, the, the narrative, redefine things as we see fit. That is one of the biggest challenges of the 21st century. Uh, let's free ourselves completely. <laughs> we don't need to be in a state of linguistic apartheid. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Agreed. <laughs> I think we've reached our time. It's yes. 45. We so, want to we wanna thank all the audience that's been yes. here. Yes. And we, we um, this has been amazing, amazing, amazing. Thank you to our panelists on behalf of our audience. I hope you all will be able to um, when head off and, and um, look at the comments once we're finished. Um, but there was also a special request. Well, actually, multiple requests. There's requests for this to be a weekend long conference because there's just not enough time in the world for as many questions as we receive. There's um, a, que a request for us to get together and create a, a, a working syllabus, right? How can people learn after this? What are some, some sources that they can read um, just to catch up to all the knowledge that we have brought together? Um, and then there was a unique request um, for Maria Terreo to bless us with her beautiful voice. Um, and I think she is willing to do so. And I think that would be a great, great way to close out our time Absolutely. together. Beautiful. So before she goes into song, I would just um, like to say thank you. Thank you, thank you to our guests, to our panelists, to our audience, um, and to Dr. Moreno Vega and Dr. Cruz for just being committed to one another and, and, and living interfaith engagement in their friendship and showing us how it can work. Um, so thank you. And I'm gonna pass it over to Maria. Unmute yourself, Maria, okay. Okay. I'm, I'm going to share with you um, a song that um, is usually sing, sung in, in ceremonies <clears throat> before they start. Um, and he goes. Gra Marigra, O Gra Marigra, Gra Marigra, Misericordia San Nicolás, Vendona al gran poder, Vendona lo miterio, Vendona la metresa. Misericordia San Nicola, ay Dios, Gramarigra, oh Gramarigra, Gramarigra, Misericordia San Nicola, el don y Dios del agua, el don la India y ne, perdona Satela. Misericordia San Nicola, ay Dios, Gramarigra, oh Gramarigra, Gramarigra, Misericordia San Nicola.
Ashe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank and we all so much. Yes, and we and the recording for this will be um, available to for all to share. And so we thank you and please uh, look out for our next time together. Thank you. Thank you all.